So real quick, I just want to give a shout out to M. Hi, M. How's it going? It's good. Hey. Because M and shout out also to Jada. Hey, Jada. Hey, you guys, M and Jada are on the ones and twos today because Christina and Grace uh, hey. both are preoccupied hey. with other things. We miss them. They'll be back tomorrow. But it is now 12.04. I think it's time. Uh, you know it. I love it. We start every single Dino 101 the exact same way. Here it is. This is your bingo board of the day. Yeah. Now remember, if you yeah. get five in any direction that is horizontal first, yeah. diagonal, send a message. Uh, Jada, can you mute yourself for a second? Your, your yeah, my bad. Is, is very talkative. I love it. Uh, yeah, as soon as you get five in any direction, send a message to either Jada or to M, and they will tell you what you have won because it is a very coveted prize. This is your Dino 101 board for the day. Take a screenshot if you need to. But probably even more important, our dino of the day. You guys have been crushed in the paleo art galleries. I've been loving it. Here it is. It is an extant, E-X-T-A-N-T, -E which means alive today, as opposed to extinct, extant dinosaur. We're going to talk about it a lot a little bit later on. This is it. Ladies and gentlemen, the turkey vulture. The turkey vulture, misunderstood a lot, but really awesome and deserving of our praise. We'll get into that in a little bit. Incredible animals. This is a, obviously wingspan. Uh, this is a zoomed in face, which I have so many questions about. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If you need some scale, this is a very uh, young man who <laughs> looks great at Moor Park Zoo with a turkey vulture. This is for scale. Again, turkey vulture, that is your dino of the day. I'm excited to see these drawings. I'm excited to see what you've named your turkey vultures. But without Further ado, we should probably introduce our guest expert for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Rick Schwartz. Rick, how are you? Where are you? Who is this with you? <laughs> uh, I am at home, as many of us are. Uh, I am a resident of San Diego. Uh, yeah. This is my assistant and daughter, Acacia, <laughs> and my other lovely assistant, my wife, April. I got who, these two are both very big fans of your program. I'm working from home most of the time, so I only get to catch bits and pieces of it. Um, but it's cool to hang out with you, my friend. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm excited you guys are here, too. I'm, I'm huge fans of the whole Schwartz clan. <laughs> so you guys are in San Diego. Rick has worked at the San Diego Zoo. He teaches at Moore Park College, uh, teaching zoology. Am I correct? Uh, actually, it's a, it's a branch of zoology, sort of. It's actually more for uh, teaching the students there who are working at the zoo to eventually become full-time animal care specialists or, or keepers uh, or trainers how to communicate what they do and to the public because it's important to make sure they understand conservation points and everything else too. So you're not just teaching science, you're teaching how to best communicate that science. Yes, a lot of communications. Awesome. I mean, that's what I try to do. I try to communicate the science behind dinosaurs. So just for a, a tiny bit of background with Rick, I met Rick about, I don't know, what's it been, like six years or so? Seven years or so? Yeah, I, I was going through photos last night, and it, they are tagged October of 2014 from when we first met uh, at the San Diego Zoo, yeah. Okay, cool. We, I, I guess I technically know. before that on Twitter or something, right? I mean, that's where we first connected. That science Twitter is an amazing resource to meet new friends. It's, and you know, you meet people you think are going to be, you know, just like very famous, maybe push you off, don't want to have the time for you. And that's, I mean, Rick, when I met you, you were chilling, this is, you know, <laughs> just chilling with different celebrities like K Christian Shaw and Ken Jong, and then like what, your best friend Kelly R Keller Riffa here? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I've been going on Kelly's show since probably 2013. And okay. we, go, we used to go a couple times a year, but now with things as they are, of course, uh, we haven't gone this year yet. So I assume you also haven't hung out with Will Ferrell recently or Ron Burgundy? No, Ron Burgundy, but I've never met Will Ferrell. Yeah, but I, I met Ron Burgundy. Yeah. Okay. I bring this up because Jada, our co-host, is a huge Ron Burgundy fan. So she is, she's freaking out right now. Uh, also, this is apparently your best friend is Betty White. Is that true? Well, I mean, not necessarily <laughs> best friend, but she was very handsy for the few days we did spend together. <laughs> we're, we're well acquainted. No, she's great. I, I adore her so much. Um, I was lucky enough to have lunch with her for two days in a row as we were doing a shoot for one of the shows she was on. And sitting down with her is sitting down with a animal friend who has wonderful knowledge of Los Angeles Zoo and San Diego Zoo and conservation, who just happens to also be an incredibly funny, talented actress too. I mean, it, but it was really more about the animals for her. It was just wonderful to have such a real person behind or in front of, I'm not sure which, the, the star of Betty White. She's wonderful. 
And I personally, I very much appreciate that you left all the fame and fortune behind to join a boy band with myself and Zach here. Yeah, Remember yeah, that is one band? of the best uh, album covers I've ever been on, yeah, honestly. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I can't wait for our second album to debut. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll drop those. We'll drop those songs at some point. Uh, this is Zoo Keeper Rick, or I'm sorry, Zoology Rick. This is his handle. You can follow him on the different platforms. Uh, he posts tons of amazing photos of different animals, uh, mostly at the San Diego Zoo. Uh, but Rick, well, this one know, I want to point out this one in particular too. I mean, it was um, my my role in the organization sends me out all over the world. So this is actually in, on an island called St. Bees Island off of the oh. coast of Queensland, where we we're doing some koala research. So this is a non-zoo photo, actually. Oh, I didn't know this was in. This is actually in Australia. Yes. yes. Rick, uh, this is. I don't know if you're going to be honest. With this. Do you remember any weird sayings or phrases that you learned in Australia? Because the things they say slightly differently have always stuck with me. Do you have any? Do you remember? Well, everything, so we, we were actually on a remote secluded island. So we didn't, I flew on a big plane, then flew on a small plane, then flew on a smaller plane, then a single engine plane to get there. And it was all with our conservation crew and veterinarians and scientists. So there, there, I was not actually, you know, put into the Australian culture so much just out in the sticks. Okay. You have a lot so, of interesting phraseology to learn. They yes, call sprinkles yes. hundreds and thousands. They call like playground slides slippery dips. <laughs> love that. The little uh, grass edge trimmers are called whipper snippers. <laughs> Good times. All right, enough messing around. We're here for a very specific hardcore reason. Rick, are you ready to play Dino or not a Dino? I, I am as ready as I'm going to be. Looks so. like you have a, a special helper who may, <laughs> may uh, help yeah, you as much as you need. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you need help beyond uh, April and Acacia, you can look around the Zoom room, kind okay. of like polling the audience. People will give you thumbs up or thumbs down to try to help right. out. They're usually somewhat helpful. <laughs> I'll let you be the judge of that. Here's how the game works. I'm going to read you 10 different animal names, some of which are real actual dinosaur names, some Dang. of which myself and my esteemed co-host, Christina, who is not here, have totally made up. And you simply have to say dinosaur or not a dinosaur. All right. I'm ready. I got the I got the gallery view open. I'm going to rely on all of these wonderful people in here to help me out because I I like dinos, but they're not, it's not my specialty. So there's a lot of weird names out there. This is not an easy game, and because of that, we you just have to get six D minus six out of ten is passing. <laughs> I should also mention, Rick, there is a theme for the non dinos. So as okay. an added bonus, if you can figure out the theme of the not dinos, you get extra high fives. Extra high fives. Excellent. Extra high fives. Here we go. Dino or not a dino, let's dig in. Number one, Komododon. Komododon. And I can spell any of these should you request it. I'm happy to spell them. Okay, I am on my own. Oh. And I guess you spell this with a K. It is K-O-M-O-D-O-D-O-N. I am going to say not a dino because I recognize that common name you slid in there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Come on. Okay. All right. You are correct. I mean, Off to a good start. I mean, I'm just. You're one for one. Okay. Okay. Next. They may get harder. Bellusaurus. Bellusaurus. B-E-L-L. So bell u saurus. Bellusaurus. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb. I'm gonna go out on a limb. I got a couple thumbs up, a couple thumbs down. I'm gonna check the gallery here. My instincts are it's it is. I'm seeing some thumbs up and some thumbs down, so the gallery is kind of split. I'm gonna go with it is. Is you are correct. Wow, two for two, Bellusaurus. Uh oh, Michael Partham. Uh, the best score thus far ever is nine out of ten. You're you're on your way. You're two for okay. two. Number three, Verona Ceratops. Verona Ceratops. Verona Ceratops. Verona. No. I'm I'm seeing no from Megan. Yeah, I'm. I feel Verona isn't. Usually, its names, not locations. Verona. Well, there's a Malawiosaurus. I will say there are animals such as Utah Raptor, a raptor yeah. in Utah. I'm not trying to. No, no. I mean, I'm, my assistant is a solid thumbs up here, um, <laughs> clearly. Um, but I'm still I have Veronosaurus. Uh, what was Veronoceratops? Veronoceratops. You know, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna default to my my assistant here and say yes. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that is not a dino. Uh, that is your bummer. first. It's okay. Nobody's perfect. You're two for two for three. Here we go. Number four, Supersaurus. 
Supersaurus. Supersaurus. I wonder if any dino stands out in the audience. I'm seeing Provinoraptor's got a thumbs up. Yeah. Aronosaurus a thumbs up. Cecilia Ceratops, a lot of thumbs up. Yes, on this because it sounds familiar to me and I see a lot of thumbs up. I'm going to go with yes. Supersaurus is a type of giant long neck sauropod. Supersaurus, you are three and one. Well done. That's four. Number five, Sumatropteryx. Sumatropteryx. No. Just straight up no. Just no, straight up no. Because I got Sumatra in there. So I'm going to. I like that you're breaking down the words. You saw Komodo, you saw Verona, Sumat. You're right. This is not a dinosaur. Sumatropteryx is not a dinosaur. Wow. Four and one. Next. Orcoraptor. Orcoraptor? O R K O raptor. Orcoraptor. <laughs> Acacia's face just did a very funny thing. She was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Orco Raptor. I'm gonna scan the gallery here, but I'm feeling in my core this is a no. no. I'm seeing a mix in the gallery. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up and thumbs down. Yeah, I see. I see a guy named Dino West with a hardcore no head shake. I feel Dino West knows what he's talking about. I, I see a Tony with two thumbs up though. Tony's got two thumbs up and a Dino shirt. Just saying. Orco with a K. Yeah. Orca with not O R C A. That's a that's an orca. That's not that's a killer okay. whale. You know that. All right. Oh. <sighs> Gosh, I'm gonna just uh, I have to go with yes on this one because there's a K in there, not a C. You are correct. <sighs> wow, five and one, crushing it. Next, Ethiopiops. Ethiopiops. See, there's a so here's what because I remember I went to oh see M's giving a hard no on that one. I just <laughs> shake her head and laugh. <laughs> I'm your co-host. You're supposed to be neutral. What are you doing? <laughs> I didn't make them up. I'm not Christina. <laughs> sure. <laughs> See, well, here's why I'm on the fence, because one of my favorite dinosaurs I got acquainted with uh, at a special thing at our Natural History Museum here a couple years back was uh, lesser known um, old world dinosaur fossils. And the Malawiosaurus was one I oh, fell yeah. in love with. So Eth Ethiopian source, I'm like, okay, well, maybe that, that is a thing, because it could be there's a Malawi. And there's... Mm -hmm. But just given the general consensus of the gallery here, I'm going with no. You're going with no. You are correct again. Wow, six and one. I should also mention Stephen Rockauer from the National Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian in DC is now in the chat. So if you really need an expert, his name is Stephen, look around. All right, that is, let's see, you've gotten six right, one wrong. That is seven, we're in the home stretch. Number eight, Haplochiris. Haplochiris. Haplochiris, how would you spell that? H-A-P-L-O. Yes. C H E I R U S. Going with a yes. Iris. Going with a yes on that one. Going with a yes again. You are correct again. Crushing it. You've got two more. Here we go. Prenocephaly. 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 P R E N O C E P H A L E. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with yes on this one. Rick, you are crushing the game right now. That is eight right, one incorrect. This is your very last one. If you get this right, you've tied for the all-time best score. Before I say it, though, do you have any idea what the theme of the not dinos are? Things like Komododon, Veronoceratops, uh, Sumatropteryx, Ethiopiops. I, I feel I have a grasp of the theme, and that's what's allowing me to, I think, plow through this. Okay, on. that may help you with this last one, then. So okay. you don't have to say it yet, but keep that in mind. The last one is Howard Schultzinator. <laughs> oh, this is a tough one. Howard Schultzinator. <laughs> do, do, people, do people know? <laughs> what do you think, Rick? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, just, I might have to go to Google on this one. <laughs> I'm going to go with no. No, you are correct. Howard Schultz is the founder of Starbucks and Komodo Verona uh, Sumatra, Ethiopia, uh, those are all types of coffees at Starbucks. Oh. And it's strange because before we started, I asked you about your coffee habit and you're like, I'm sorry, I quit. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's a recent quit. So I still remember all my lovely okay. coffees I used to have. So don't awesome. you worry. <laughs> well, Rick, you have now tied for the best score ever. You got nine out of 10. Ooh. You have won the right to stay on the Zoom call. If you lose, Yay. we just boot you. We just boot you. Okay. <laughs> 
I am so glad. <laughs> All right, but we're not here to talk about coffee or, well, dinos that are not dinos. We're here to talk about some of your absolute favorite animals and some of my favorite animals as well. So Rick, let's jump right into it. I'm gonna show a picture. I'm gonna let you take it away and tell us who this is or what this is and why you are so enamored with this particular animal. Oh, <laughs> that is a binturong, also known as a bear cat. And there's a variety of different subspecies. So they're in a variety of sizes, sizes and colorations. So the one you see here has got a lot of the gray highlights or the salt highlights, but there are some that are much darker with only a little bit of the highlights on the face and head. The binturong or bear cat is native to uh, Southeast Asia. Um, similar habitats you'd find orangutans in, uh, usually forested, usually hilly areas. Um, they are an arboreal carnivore in the sense that they're, I shouldn't say they're a carnivore, they're, they're listed scientifically and they have the dentition or tooth structure and digestive system of a carnivore, but they're omnivorous. So they don't actively aggressively hunt. If they can catch something, they'll eat it. If not, they'll simply find some fruit or vegetation later. Um, that long tail you can see in this picture here is a prehensile tail. So as thick as that tail looks, it's not just hair. It's a very muscular tail. And as an adult, that can hold about 50% of their body weight. And the back feet assist and the front feet can reach out. Or as they're climbing down, they can help slow their descent with that tail. Um, that thick, coarse coat, people sometimes think it's a cold weather animal, but they're a rainforest. Oh, that face, those know, whiskers right? too. So uh, if you look at this picture, you can see the pupils have slits. Uh, they are excellent nocturnal animals, but they are awake crepuscular, meaning usually in the twilight hours, sleep midday, sleep middle of the night, and then up in between there in those twilight hours. But, you know, if, if food or resources are nighttime only or daytime only, they do well in both. Uh, this picture too, you can see those cool ear tufts. Not only does it add to the adorableness, uh, but it serves a purpose. Being in the rainforest all the time, they have to be out uh, in, the in the rain. Their coat, I kind of like to compare it to Gore-Tex. It is waterproof, but it breathes well. It's a very thick, coarse hair. And those ear tufts help water then uh, not only shut off the rest of the body the way the hair is, but those ear tufts then keep water from going into the ears. So uh, all around, super awesome animal. Um, I think probably one of the more interesting attributes is their effervescence or smell of popcorn. I was, uh, was going to ask, what's the deal with that? Everyone's always like, they smell like popcorn. They do. It's the best smell in the world. I absolutely love it. Um, it's, it's the greatest. Um, it, is, it is a roasted corn nut or popcorn type smell. And for the longest time, the science that was out there um, a, had everyone believing that it was a scent gland on the rump that created the smell. And undoubtedly, bin trunks have a better sense of smell than you and I do. So they could definitely discern between popcorn and people or popcorn and other bin trunks. Their scents can pick on if it's a male or female bin trunk, all the other notes in there that we can't pick up. Recently, though, a couple of years ago, they started to break things down and realized that it is actually the natural um, bacteria that resides in the hair of the bin trunk. And then there's a chemical compound in their urine that is a well-known compound, which I can never remember it, but I think I, I brought it up on my other computer. Uh, yes, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong because I'm horrible with things. Uh, two acetyl dash one pyroline, and is a, is a chemical that's in their urine. And so when that chemical hits the bacteria on their fur, because when they pee, they tend to drag their tail through it or their rump through it to help mark the territory, uh, it, that, uh, combination of chemistry between the chemicals in their urine, bless you, <laughs> and the bacteria on their fur creates that popcorn type smell. Uh, it's very, very interesting why this exists with them and not in other species or, or why it's so prominent in them uh, is not known, but it is uh, pretty fascinating stuff. Cool. So just a reminder to everyone in the Zoom room, send your questions today to M and Jada. Uh, Christina and Grace are, I gave them the day off. I gave him the day off. So uh, Jada and M will take all your questions. We'll follow them to Rick in a second. Um, I also want to mention just real quick, I'm going to spotlight M for a second because M, you are a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, which are the yes. Bearcats. And literally it wasn't until last year that I realized that Binturong, Bearcat is the Binturong. It's the same thing. I, I didn't even yeah. put it together. Yep. This is Lucille. She's a baby Bearcat and she goes to all of the football games. Okay. <laughs> Uh, great segue. <laughs> Speaking of baby bear cats, can we just watch this for a second? I know, right? <laughs> I, over the last few days on Twitter, a ton of zookeepers have been posting stuff about Venturong. It's like, this is perfect. 
This guy, you're right, just incredibly cute. About how old is, do you, can you guess, Rick, about how old this Ventron is? I would guess this one's probably about three or four months at this point. Um, not really being able to judge size, but looking at the length of the nose and the, and, uh, the ear tufts, I'm guessing probably three to four months. Okay. And how and long does it take until they're, adorable. how long until they're fully mature? Uh, well, so full growth as far as full size, uh, they'll hit that about a year to a year and a half, but maturity comes a little bit later. Uh, it staggers a little bit between uh, males and females. Uh, females come into maturity a little bit earlier than the boys do. Cool. All right. So that was the Binturong. I know it's, is that your favorite? I mean, are you allowed to say your favorite animal? You know, for the longest time, I, I took care of many, many species of animals um, in my career and all the different places I've worked and what I've done, you know, and you mentioned earlier the vulture starting at Moore Park. And I just felt it's inappropriate for me to say I have a favorite, but the truth, the truth of the matter is, I mean, yeah, it's the Binturong. I mean, I've worked with the <laughs> No, I mean, it's, it, I, it's one of those things where I worked with one uh, for many, many years until, you know, the end of his life and just really a special deep bond that the best I could compare it to, to make someone understand who does not work with animals, think of your best work friend you have at work. Yeah. You only see them at work, but you guys are like the best of buds. You just get each other. And that's what it was. And ever since then, uh, I just, I can't not look at a Bintrong or Bearcat and not feel an emotional swell in my body of love and admiration. So uh, it is tied to that relationship with him, but that, that is what it is. I love that. I love that you're like, listen, I'm not allowed to play favorites, but the Bearcat. <laughs> <laughs> But the um, Fusa is like right there. Fusa, Red Panda, all those other guys are like right there, right behind wait, the bear. The, the what? The what, Rick? What'd you say? Fusa. A Fasa. You call him Fasa. So there's two ways to say the name. Uh, if the more the English way is uh, the way you say it. Uh, fa Fusa. No, Fasa. I don't think. Fasa. <laughs> I usually try to go with Malagasy, which is more French influence, which is Fusa. But either way is correct. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So I wanted to bring up this. Isa, the Fusa in particular, because I, I think maybe I'd like heard of the name Fusa at one point, but I never actually seen one until that maybe seven years ago or so that I met you at the San Diego Zoo and you showed me that very Fusa, Isa, yeah. let me bring that back up. And, uh, and now it's tied for my favorite animal with the cheetah. I mean, I'll let you tell us whatever you want to tell us about the Fusa, Rick, but I just, I have a few pictures, like, look at this animal. I, like, I just, it's magical to me. So it's, many ways. Well, yeah, stop on this picture real quick. Everyone yeah. look at the arms on this animal. So, oh. <laughs> right? So here's the thing. I had never worked with a Fusa before. Isa came to us at about a day old because his mom wasn't taking care of him. And so we ended up raising him. That's why he's, he's very little and young here in this picture here. But going back to that other picture though, the, the Fusa is the current, it's, there was a, another species of Fusa that's extinct now, but, and that was the largest, but the, the Fusa we have today is the largest a uh, carnivorous land mammal in Madagascar. They hunt lemurs very successfully and very well. And so they're, they're a little bit bigger than uh, oversized house cat, really. I mean, or, or maybe a, a small to medium sized dog, but longer in length. So you look at them, you don't think they're very formidable as a predator, but when you look at the structure of the body and, and the anatomy, the way the muscles anchor into the opposing uh, uh, joint further away, it gives more leverage for that muscle. And the, I can tell you as someone who's worked with easily 60 different species, um, carnivores, herbivores, birds, reptiles, mammals, I have never ever worked with a species um, as cunning and smart and strong and fast as the FUSA. They, they are absolutely amazing. Um, I have seen an animal walk into a space, you know, just walk into a space and quickly glance around and it has now assessed where everything is and will do a lateral jump knowing where it's going because of where it looked earlier. It's just an amazing, amazing animal on so many levels. Yeah, I, I fell in love with these guys immediately. So they're, they say, people say they're cat-like, but they're most closely related to mongoose. Is that true? Not what even true, no. So yeah, when, when European scientists first found them, they did think they were some sort of um, cat that had, when the, when the island of Madagascar split from India, they believed that perhaps this species, like many of the other animals there, because they're isolated for millions of years, they evolved differently. So but they believed they had a, a root in the felid family. Uh, with more research, you're like, no, actually, they have more structures similar to the mongoose family. So it's probably a mongoose animal that has been, um, you know, separated for these millions of years. And now, uh, 2007 or eight, with we started to really use DNA science to look at, um, you know, the 
the way these animals are related or not, ends up Fusa, not related to anybody that we would say as mongoose or felid. So they're in their own group of Eupleridae, and there's seven other individuals on Madagascar that are carnivores that are also in that, that group or that family. Uh, so they are not technically uh, related to the mongoose or the felid. They have put Eupleridae, uh, or Eupleridae, however you want to say it, uh, in the the branches of, of the big tree uh, of scientific order, I believe it is next to the mongoose family, okay. um, but it's not branched into it. They, they believe they might have had a, a very, 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 very distant ancestor, as many of the, the carnivores do. So I have a couple specific questions, and then M and Jada, I'd love to take a couple questions from the chat. So um you are we i showed you this picture a minute ago and this is one of the things that kind of blew my mind about the mongoose is the length of its tail i couldn't even find a good picture this is obviously a stock image um the length of its tail is basically like the length of the rest of its body which yes. is bonkers so i'm curious if you could talk to us a little bit about how it uses that tail as well as how it uses these crazy foot pads right. these are amazing adaptations i assume for survival and hunting tell us a little bit about them Okay, so the FUSA is an incredible predator, as I mentioned. They are fast on the ground and they are fast in the trees. There's a couple of clips I found years ago, I don't even know if they're still there on YouTube, where there's some uh, FUSA running through trees um, to hunt. And it's just, the agility is remarkable. Uh, so the foot pad you're looking at here is the back foot. They have a flat plantar step like our foot. So where my one finger is, is on the heel. You can see the toes there with my thumb. That pad, the way it is structured, as it wraps its foot, because that foot has flexibility, those pads come together and basically pinch onto a branch. It gives us an extended grip beyond the toes. So there's claws, there's toes, and then the structure of that pad allows that extra grip. That foot can also rotate 180 degrees. So no matter what direction they're going, those feet can maneuver and allow them to grip appropriately as they run. So the tail is important for balance. The tail uh, is the same length of the body so from nose to rump is the same length from rump to end of tail. And it's not a prehensile tail like the Bintrong, but it is muscular at the base, which allows them to push it against things to counterbalance as they're climbing down out of a tree, they can push it against a branch or whatever. Um, and they use it while jumping through the air to, to sort of help maneuver their body and keep it level or, or turn as they need to. So yeah, I mean, there's, if you could, if you could think of, uh, you know, any dinosaur in your your knowledge of dinosaurs, it is the uh, super predator capable of hunting in many different elements and and yeah. you know day night trees ground whatever speed. Um, this is a superhero of, of predators, really. No, I love that you asked that because that's we basically talked about exactly that yesterday with a big cat scientist. We talked about the different behavioral and physical adaptations apex predators or well, cat apex predators have today. And then what clues can that give us about how dinosaurs 60 some million years ago may have hunted in what environments using what strategies. So yeah, that's one of the reasons I love the, uh, the FUSA because it has a strange combination of features uh, that we don't see in a lot of other animals. And that immediately makes me think of the features in dinosaurs. So M, Jada, uh, M, let's go with you first. M because you have a bear cat uh, background, can you funnel us a couple questions from that? Right. Yes, um, right off the bat, Megan asked, is it pronounced zoology or zoology? Oh, good question. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Like, like many things in language, uh, different words have different roots, and it depends on who you talk to and where they're from. I have heard it said zoology and zoology. Um, and that's true for many common names in many species, too. It depends on regions, on how things are pronounced. So. I am not a stickler for exact uh, pronunciation because I recognize that different cultures have different ways. Even within a culture, different regions have different ways of saying things. Uh, M, another question. Right. Before you say that other question, though, I just want to mention, I forgot that Natty, one of our esteemed Dino 101 All-Stars, actually did get 10 out of 10 once. So uh -huh. you're, you're a silver medalist. You're on the medal stand, Rick. You know, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. I'd even take bronze, you know? I mean, I'm right. just happy to be here. Just happy to be here. All right, M. <laughs> What else? Yeah, All right. <laughs> um, Tyronosaurus asked, what are your thoughts on endangered species being kept and bred as pets? Does it contribute to the problem or to growing the population? If yes, how would that be different from zoos breeding? Binturongs are common pets in rural parts, parts of Malaysia, and there's a lot of debate between the rural folk and animal conservationists, kind of like Tiger King. Is licensing a possibility to help? Wow. 
there's a whole lot to unpack in that question. Yeah. Um, so I will try to answer it as accurately as possible without going over my time limit. Um, <laughs> essentially, the way conservation is working right now is multiple groups working together. And that's accredited zoos, conservation organizations, uh, non-governmental agencies, and governmental agencies. Um, so, and the way they work together is a coordinated effort of understanding the genetics of the animals that are being bred to save the species, uh, where that work is being done, who and how are they collaborating to make sure it's being done properly, uh, and what is the actual true motivation of doing that kind of work. And so that's where we kind of need to start when we talk about animals being bred to save a species. Um, when it comes to, when I hear the term pet and someone breeding them as pets, then to me the, the desire is to have that animal in your possession because you, you want to be with it. And as much as I love Fusa and Bintrongs and a, a huge list of other species, I don't want them in my home. I don't want them, uh, I don't work with them because I feel that I, I want to have them as a pet. I recognize them for the importance that they are to their species and their type. And the work that I do, specifically in the work I train other people to do when I, or, when I teach at Moore Park College, is to make sure that when we have those animals in the zoo environment, we recognize our responsibility to share their stories and their plight with other people to hopefully get them involved in either slightly changing their behavior for conservation, whether it's locally or even contributing to those organizations doing the work. Um, I don't think there is a perfect yes or no answer to that question because we are in a time right now on this planet where we have a lot of species that are getting closer and closer to that extinction mark. And as, as Dustin can tell you, once they're extinct, then all we have are fossils, memories, and photos, uh, and even some species, species not photos. Um, so I, I don't want to be so grandiose to say that other people outside of zoos and conservation organizations can't help, um, but it's just a matter of making sure that they're doing things the right way for the right reason in coordination with those uh, doing work on the ground. Good answer. Uh, Jada, you got a couple questions for us. We're going to come back to some more questions at the end, but we do have one more of Rick's favorite animals to talk about. Kind of been tricky, you, right? I mean, it's dino of the day. Yeah, right. We're going to come back to that in a sec, but Jada, hit us with a couple questions. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, so Laurel is asking, do, pre do prehensile tails have bones in them? Ooh. Sweet question. And yes, they do all the way down to the tip. Uh, the way the joints and the vertebrae that make up the tail uh, work are a little, little more unique in the flexibility uh, of prehensile tailed animals than maybe your dog or cat at home. Uh, they have flexibility in the tail as well but they don't have the muscle tissue in there and the connective tissue that going all the way down to really give it the full ability to move. You know, a dog can bring its tail up or down or curl it a little bit. And the prehensile tail with a full ability to grasp, whether it's a spider monkey or whatever, or kinkajou even, uh, there's a lot of muscle tissue in there that is different and the vertebrae are structured slightly different as well to allow for that movement and that grip. Cool. Okay, awesome. And then I have one from Michael. He says, question for Rick. Have you seen? Sorry, my nephew is <laughs> very excited. Having fun. Anyway, um, have you seen any of the Jurassic Park movies? And if so, as a zookeeper, do you have any critique on their animal management? Oh, <laughs> I love that question. Yeah, tell us why Jurassic Park was such a great idea, Rick. <laughs> it's you know okay. He said he was going to do a whole episode of all. Didn't yeah. you say you were going to do a whole? We're we're gonna try. I want to do a, just a Jurassic Park specific show. So this will be a preview. Okay, so here's the thing. I love those movies for entertainment value. Um, as far as the actual uh, care for and um, working with and uh, how the behavior. So I, obviously, I don't know anything about dinosaur behavior because I've never met a dinosaur, right? But I've spent my life studying or animal behavior. And what I know of animals today, a lot of the stuff they have the dinosaurs do, it's just like, oh, they wouldn't be roaring if they're attacking. They don't, nobody roars when they attack, you know? But yeah, I mean, they're, they're great movies. I enjoyed them. Um, but clearly a lot of the stuff that occurs there is there to drive the plot and storyline along. So we have to suspend <laughs> what may or may not actually or should have 
or should not have happened. <laughs> I guess is the best way to say it. Right. I never really thought about the idea of like roaring while attacking. It's like I just had this image of me when I go running, just screaming at the top of my lungs while I'm running down the street. Right? Yeah. That's what, all right. So you guys, we're going to come back to some more questions from you guys in a little bit, but we have to hit our third and most important animal of the day. Um, so here we go. Oh, whoops. Wait, I have a question. Whoops. Oh. oh. Sorry. I had to. I had to. You know I had to. Look at these guys. <laughs> All right, Rick, um, can you tell us who this dapper young man is and what animal he is with? Well, um, this, this goes back a few years. I mean, maybe two or three years ago. Um, <laughs> I would have been in my 20s there, early 20s. Yeah, that's that's me. Um, my second year at Moore Park College, where I now teach part-time. Um, I got my start there at the uh, teaching zoo that they have, and this is a, a turkey vulture. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the, um, the movie Airplane, there is a brief moment where they talk about death or doom, and one of the characters has a turkey vulture on its shoulder. Uh, that's that guy there in that picture with me. Oh, His name is Puppy. That he was a, what's that? Literally that turkey vulture. Literally that individual. Yeah, he is oh. now forty-four years old, I think. Wow. Yeah, Look they the live a long thing. time. How long do they um, live? They'll live. Well, condors will live, and others in this group will live usually into their sixties. Wow. I'm not exactly one hundred percent sure how long turkey vultures. They reach full sixty, or if they're more fifty, but. You know, he's 44, 45 now at least, and he's doing great. He's still up there. I get to see him when I go up to teach. Um, but yeah, so it's such a funny thing. You know, I got into Moore Park College all about big cats. I wanted to work with big cats, and uh, I love carnivores, still do. Um, but, um, you know, I, I never would have guessed in a million years I would have fallen over the turkey vulture. You look at them, they're not something you go, oh, that's, I love that. But as I got to know him and know the species, they are incredible animals, very smart. They're semi-social, so you have to really develop a relationship with this animal. Not, you, you don't just show up and say, okay, we're buddies now. There's actual time you have to spend to gain the trust and get that, the, the, um, that relationship built. And once it's once you're in, though, once you're part of the flock, oh, my gosh, it's just like, it's amazing. Uh, talk about a VIP room. So this here kind of shows up that wingspan about six feet. Uh, they're common all throughout, um, you know, North and South America and Central America. Uh, some people will look up and confuse them for the condor. That that nice um, white or gray sort of V that is made up by the wingspan. So you have the black wing, back black feathers up front, <clears throat> and the underside of the primaries make up that V. That is not something that the California condor has. So if you see something soaring up above that's got that V shape to it or the V coloration. Uh, v is for vulture, not for condor, so it's a good way to remember it. Oh, uh, okay. The bald head, of course, uh, for sticking their head in the carcass but not getting gunk stuck on it. The hole through the nose there, they're hardcore, but they don't have a pierce. They're born that way. <laughs> That's uh, what I was one, what's, what's the deal with that? Hole? Because it allows for better sense of smell. So this is one of the few birds that actually has an active sense of smell. Uh, there are a lot of bird species out there that are uh, eating carrion also, but they rely on eyesight. Your larger vultures and larger condors will be higher up in elevation looking for smaller vultures circling. The smaller vultures stay at a lower altitude, allowing them to pick up on the scent of something dead. And um, it, it's kind of fun side note that I was taught when I was in Moore Park College. Um, the gas companies, when they were first installing natural gas lines across uh, the U.S., would use vultures as an opportunity to see where a gas leak might be because that smell we put in natural gas doesn't have an odor naturally but they put in that sulfur smell which is similar to a carcass rotting um and the vultures would pick up on that and if they were circling over where they knew a line was they'd go check it out to find the leak oh very cool nice so hold on where'd that go i have a picture uh, so again uh all questions to jada and em i'm sure you guys have some vulture and probably more binturong and fossa questions fusa i'm sorry Boost of question. Either way. Tell us, as those are coming in, I don't know a ton about vultures other than that they are able to eat like rotting corpses and flesh that other animals, it would either make them incredibly sick or even kill them. Yeah. Because they have certain bacteria in their guts. Like how does that work? How do they survive on stuff other things can't eat? Yeah. So a great example would be an animal dies from anthrax. So if another animal were to eat that, or if that anthrax bacteria were to get into the water system from a rainstorm, other animals would get sick from it. Vultures can land on that carcass, start eating that, process it out. All that comes out the other side is bird poop, no anthrax. Uh, there's a lot of bacteria and viruses that for whatever reason, they can consume it and their body just kills it and is done. So scientists are currently studying the turkey vulture and a few other species to see what is it about their system that allows them 
to bring in such toxic uh, tissue to consume and not even get slightly sick from it. So we don't know as of yet, I haven't seen any published papers as to how or why, we just know that they can. And this is something that they're looking at seriously as a possible uh, thing to help all of us survive. The, the other sort of uh, next step to that though, the very sad and realistic thing is there's been this super quick, sudden rush of, uh, or I shouldn't say rush, a drop in population of vultures, especially in, in Africa and Asia, because poachers are laying out carcasses with poison. The reason they want to kill vultures is similar to like I mentioned with the gas line, the gas leak. You can see the vultures give away that location. When poachers are killing animals for horns or tusks or, or whatever reason, those vultures are going to start circling over those carcasses and gives away the location. Rangers have learned if they go and check where the, why these vultures are circling, many times they can find poachers or at least start tracking the poachers from that point to catch them. So poachers are now setting out uh, poisoned carcasses to kill the vultures. And we've seen a, in a very dramatic and scary drop in populations of vultures that then the result, of course, can be you won't have that cleanup crew anymore. Yeah. So when these animals die from disease or bacteria, that cleanup crew won't be there to clean it up. And then suddenly you're going to have that in waterways and other areas. It's going to affect human populations along with other species too. Uh, it, it could really be a scary situation. So there's many groups out there right now studying uh, what we can do to start really turning that around for the vultures. Cool. Misunderstood, but obviously incredibly amazing animals and helpful to stop poaching. We just have yeah. to figure out how we got to get them like little badges to work with the, <laughs> with, with the cops and anti-poachers. All right. So uh, Jada and M, I'm sure we have a couple more questions. Uh, as we start going through these questions, Rick, I'm actually going to start scrolling through our, our art gallery. I'm excited to see awesome. these amazing, uh, Turkey one, Bowl renditions. Yeah, one thing real quick before we run out of time, though. Do you guys still do the dance party? Uh, we, we, we've never done a... Yes, the answer is yes, We of course. Let's do it. Because, and, and this is why. I think you need to know this one last little bit about the FUSA. I do. In any of the pictures that shows the FUSA's bell, you'll see it's kind of a, a, a nice sandy color with sort of a red rust marking. They have a scent gland on their chest. Where that cause the oils cause that rusty color. So in fact, in this picture here, he's probably here. She's probably starting or just finished the fusa dance. And what that is is they grab on to a tree or a branch okay. and they start rubbing back and forth. So I thought maybe it'd be appropriate if maybe we end with a little fusa dance. I mean, can I do it on this chair and just like? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of stop and you look, make sure no one's like sneaking up on you, and then you do it some more. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I like that. Maybe we'll do that at the end. But go ahead with the questions, and I want to see the artwork. I want to see what we got for, for Turkey. All right, let's, now that we've got all our uh, physical requirements out, M, let's start with M, our co-host today. What do we got here, M? Just the head. You've been busy doing co-host duties, so just the head is fine. Uh -huh. This yeah. is who, Terry? Terry. Terry the turkey vulture. Terry the turkey vulture. My other uh, co-host for today, Jada. This looks like it's straight out of, uh, it's like <laughs> every time there's like a foghorn, leghorn-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas? Also, yes, Thomas Van, the turkey vulture. Right on. Where'd you get that name? What's? Uh, I wanted a TV, because I've always had alliteration with all of my names, so that's what I, I came up with. I knew there's a reason I loved you. Alliteration. There's, there's few <laughs> things we love here more than dinosaurs. Alliteration is close. All right, Margo. Let's see what Margo's got. Everyone uh, always comes with the, oh, wow. Wow. By the way, Justin, I'm going to unmute uh, Michael, because he's had his hand raised. Please, yeah, go ahead. Okay, you're unmuted. You so for Rick, uh, to build on my question from earlier, uh, because I went to a Seneca Park Zoo that's in Rochester, my hometown, and I was actually wearing this very shirt. It's like a Jurassic Park parody. Oh, I can't and we got into talking about Jurassic Park, and he mentioned that scene in Jurassic World where uh, Chris mm -hmm. Pratt is like trying to train the raptors with that clicker that uh, yeah. uh, zoologists usually, usually have, and he's like, click, 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 and the zoologist was saying, Oh, we don't do that. We don't just click, click, click all the time. We just do one click and then reward the animal with whatever behavior they had and give them a piece of something to eat. So those sorts of things that they show in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, I'm wondering if you ever had any thoughts like, well, we don't do that or we would do that differently. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think the, there's, a, there's a lot of moments where you, as someone who works in animal behavior and, oh, these are some good artwork. I, I, I don't want to talk about the artwork. The artwork is pretty awesome. You guys are, these are really, really good. Um, of Vincent the Vulture. I love it. Uh, so yeah, to answer your question, Michael, definitely. I mean, the, the clicker thing, of course, was huge for all of us in, in the world of animal behavior and understanding that that's not how you use the clicker. It's to bridge the behavior for, and, and set up for the reward, um, or at least, you know, intermittent reward, uh, where he was using more as, a, as both a, a 
get attention to sort of recall and also, uh, but also then as a, re as a bridge or a reward, as if they did something he wanted, he would also do it then. So it was a very unclear and any animal you're working with, oh, that Greta, I like Greta. Look at that, is that ink? Wow. Um, you know, the, the way they were using the clicker for any species of animal that we currently have alive today, if you were to work with them that way, they would be very confused and behavior would break down very quickly. So yeah, things like that, definitely. Ooh, Zook, I like that one. Popcorn, oh, right on, through the popcorn in there. Victor the vulture, <laughs> looking good. Nice. I have a question from Maddie. Um, what is the most endangered animal at the zoo that you work at? Oh boy, the most endangered. Um, uh, <laughs> hey, we have, yeah, you know, we, I can't think of the species name off the top of my head, but we do have, <laughs> oh, Robert the vulture, right on. Looking good, Robert. Um, we do have a wide variety of um, birds and insects that people don't tend to think about are very, very endangered species that there might only be a few left. Like, uh, you know, we have um, in our population, but actually on our, um, there's a facility on the island of Hawaii, we have a species of bird where there's only a few of them left on the planet and they live there for breeding purposes. Oh, Aurora looks good. Yeah. Aura, I'm sorry, Aura, Aura the turkey vulture. Uh, so, um, gosh, I'd have to really double check, but I would say probably a bird or, or insect species we have uh, where there's only a few left on the planet. Um, you know, we, we had con California condors were down to 22 um, just back in the 80s, and now they're over almost 500 in the population, so they don't really qualify for being most endangered. But you may not think of it too, a lot of plant species. Uh, there are certain plant species that uh, other than being in a seed bank or maybe a few uh, at a zoological facility or botanical garden, uh, they don't exist in the wild anymore. So I would want to double check my homework on that, but those are things to think about. You know, it's not always the big megafauna that we, we know and love. Sometimes it's a species we may never even heard of. Sure. Any more questions from M and Jada? As we're I specifically have a question. Good. So I should say, Rick, by the way, Jada is our shark expert in the room. She's going to graduate school next year to study sharks. Where are you going again, Jada? Uh, University of Washington. Cool. So she will yeah, be you know. left coast with you. Hit us, yeah. Jada. What's up? My, yeah, my question is, have you seen the movie Madagascar? And how <laughs> do you like the depiction of Fusa in that movie? Interesting. I have seen the movie Madagascar and I love it. It's very entertaining. <laughs> I also think it's funny how they depicted the Fusa, but it does a disservice for the species. But of course, uh, they need them to be that way to drive the movie. What is a, actually very accurate though, in the movie, when they show up, when the Fusa shows up, everyone freaks out. That's, ah, it's a dreaded Fusa. It's kind of interesting when you start studying the history of the Fusa and the interactions uh, of the Fusa in the Malagasy culture, that is actually a thing. So we don't know, so there's an extinct species of Fusa that's about twice the size of the current uh, species that we have on the planet. Um, also a resident of Madagascar. So these stories might have come from the giant Fusa uh, or the bigger Fusa, um, but there are stories in the Malagasy culture about them stealing uh, livestock, stealing babies from, the, in, from their crib in the middle of the night, sort of all those old stories we, uh, in our current culture in America, in European culture, where we kind of have come from, you know, as far as the stories, the big bad wolf, Red Riding Hood, all these stories about this cunning bad wolf trying to do bad things and kind of be, you know, really make it scary. Uh, those similar type of stories exist for the Fusa. So there were parts in the movie Madagascar where the reaction to the Fusa showing up is actually fairly accurate for the culture, uh, but it's a disservice to the species because they aren't just some bumbling, drooling predator. Uh, they are incredibly smart and um, deserve a lot more uh, sort of credit than that. But it, you know, it's a cartoon, it's fun. So I have an intruder. Um, just quick, I don't think we mentioned this. Rick, what is the general like upper size limit on a Fusa weight wise? Because it's hard to kind of tell because half its body is its tail. Yeah, so they, there is documentation that states they could get up to uh, 18 to 20 kilograms, but um, what is that really number? closer to 15 is probably the max size for a male. What is that um, in pounds? Because I, I can't do the math. It's about 30 pounds, sorry. Okay. About 30 pounds, 15 kilograms, 30 pounds, give or take. Um, 34, I guess we do all the math. Um, but even, I mean, the females can be quite a bit smaller than that. Uh, so close, you know, almost half that size. Okay. Um, again, people look at them, they think, oh, it looks like some sort of, you know, mix of a, a mountain lion and a, a house cat because it's smaller and it's sleeker and, and it's coloration. But 
Uh, again, don't let that smaller size, you might think, oh, I got a, a dog at home that's 30 pounds, you know, no big deal. D don't let that fool you. They are structurally different than any other predator and faster and smarter than anything I've ever met. Yeah, that's why, that's one of the reasons why I love them. All right, so we're going to take one more question. Uh, if I'm going to let M and Jada fight over who has or wants to ask a question. I want to remind everyone, first of all, thank you guys for being here every single day. We do this literally every day at noon Eastern. If you want to support this, I'm Dustin hyphen Growick on Venmo. That's G-R-O-W-I-C-K. Um, I love you guys. This literally gives me light every single day. I'm excited to meet you in the Zoom room. Let's do one last question. All right. Um, hey, Dustin. After, okay. <laughs> Catherine asked, uh, in Australia, following the bushfires, floods, and now COVID, there is lots of discussion at the zoo I work at in response to all of these disasters. Do you think that this is a turning point in public engagement and acceptance for the need uh, of the need for conversation? How do you think zoos will respond? This is Catherine, by the way. She's all, <laughs> hi, coming all the way from Melbourne. What time is it? I'm going to unmute you just so you can tell us what time it is where you are. It is almost three. Almost three a.m. <laughs> wow, yeah. that is that is dedication to the Zoom room. Okay, Rick, sorry. Uh, go ahead and try. No, to don't answer. be sorry. No, so Catherine asked the question, right? Yes. So, a turning point. I didn't quite catch the last part of it, the way M, M said it. Oh. The, the turning point of what land houses respond to to what exactly? Uh, the um, need for conservation. Oh, need for conservation. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, so. I can't speak for all zoos. I know where I've worked and the places I've worked with and the places I engage with. And we have always been uh, working very hard. Oh, geez, that's awkward. <laughs> and I can't move it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Phone's tied to the computer. Um, so we, we always are working towards conservation. You look at some of the, the top conservation spearheading organizations in the world and there's a zoo involved or a zoo that's doing it. Um, I think as far as the public side of it's concerned, I think I can say in my 25, 26 plus years of doing this kind of work of working with animals and engaging the public that um, I, I, can, I can honestly say that in that time span that I've been doing this, the increase of curiosity for conservation in animal care has increased, which has been lovely to see. Yeah. When I first started doing this, people wanted to see animals and ask them cool questions like, oh, well, who would win between a fight between a gorilla and a lion? And that was pretty much it, you know? And then now in, in the, the days we have, you know, now people, like you were saying, because of the fires, because of the viruses, because of climate change, people are like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? How can we help? What, what can we do? And, and the nice thing is because many zoological facilities have already been doing this kind of work for so long, quietly behind the scenes, um, you know, actually not just having a zoo, but actually doing the work in the wild as well, different locations around the world, they can now open those doors and say, look, you want to help? Here's what we're doing. You know, you want to participate, you want to save a, a pangolin, you want to save a panda, you want to save whatever. These are the conservation efforts we already have in place. Join us and we can educate people that way. And I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about the public being more interested in engaging on that level because it's super important. It, it impacts us all. One thing I say often in my talks and presentations is that, you know, it's not about just saving the warm, fuzzy animals or the ones you happen to have an, a, a, a liking for. It's about really taking care of the ecosystems that we all share. Because like I said with the vulture, we lose a vulture, suddenly our water's gonna change dramatically because of the pollution of bacteria and viruses and things like that. So it's all interwoven. And I know Dustin, your friends here in your, your chat understand that concept that science where they get it. Um, but it's just super important that I think the general public starts to learn that and I think they're starting to. And that's, Rick, that's great. That's a great place to leave it. Um, I love that you used a dinosaur. Remember, birds are not just descendants of dinosaurs. They're literally living dinosaurs. And you use a misunderstood dinosaur to talk about why conservation is so important, why these animals are so amazing. So thank you for being here, Rick. Thank you to April and Acacia for hanging out and being your co-host. Thank you for M to M and Jada on the ones and twos. You guys, tomorrow we have a special secret guest that I can't even announce to you yet. You just have to trust me, it's gonna be great tomorrow. But for now, I don't care if you're scooping coffee beans or sticking your beak deep into the, the bowels of a dead animal like a turkey vulture does. Never stop digging. I'll see you guys tomorrow, Wednesday noon. I love you guys, I'll see you soon. Thank you again, Rick. Thanks to Emily. Emily, I just called you Emily, M. I, ugh. I got to get some coffee Justin. too. Bye guys. Have a great Tuesday.